amazing. <laughs> um, and I think Dr. Oman Haney and uh, Demma told me it's cold in Kuwait as well this morning. So you're very welcome, Dr. Oman Haney, and thank, thank you, you for being thank you for being so generous with your time and for being here. So I just want to make some introductions first of all. So my name is Neve Mullen. I am part of the Compass Careers team oh, with the RCSI. Um, my colleagues Kira and I think Paul is here also, and the Compass Manager Noel O'Callaghan has kindly joined us here this morning. So what we do in the Compass Careers team is we um, provide support to all students within RCSI. Um, we are available for confidential one-to-one -one meetings. You can book these via Career Hub and any other career queries that you might have, you can reach us at the Career Hub email or you can email us directly. Um, we run career clinics on a Wednesday and Thursday lunchtime. We host those on BBC and the links are on the Career Readiness Centre Moodle page. All I students like are, the... are welcome. And we also host a number of workshops and events similar to what we're doing here this morning. Through the here. Mute. Again, somebody I think is, if you can mute your microphones, that would be very helpful. Um, we run a number of workshops and events throughout the year, such as this here this morning. Um, and we advertise everything on all the various social media platforms and on our own um, Career Readiness Centre Moodle page. So just to give you an idea of what we're going to run through here this morning. So I'm going to talk through the most popular pathway for Kuwaiti or CSI students, um, give you a, a sort of a very brief overview and an outline of the timelines for each of those pathways. Address really, well, what is it that you can be doing now and looking at a career matching strategy? And then Dr. Al Mohaney is going to talk through the Kuwait pathway. And then we'll have time for some questions and answers at the end. There's not too many of us here this morning. So if at any stage you do have a question, feel free to turn on your microphone and ask. That's no problem. If you'd rather keep it till the end, that's fine. And if you want to type it into the chat function, we can address it there also. So if I could ask you to all mute your mics, that would be great. So the first thing to consider really is, well, where are you going to train? So there is a world of opportunities open to you. There's lots of different pathways that you can take. But if we look at sort of the top five countries where Kuwaiti or CSI graduates, oh, this is going back probably over the last five years where they commence their postgraduate training. And that is Kuwait, Ireland, Canada, the USA, and the UK and in that order. So I have just put up there sort of very briefly to run through what the ranks are in Kuwait and what the internship year will consist of. As I said, Dr. Al Mulhaney can talk you through this. He is the expert in this field. So really this is just to give you a quick uh, brief snapshot of what the internship year consists of and the different ranks in, uh, that are um, the pathway in Kuwait, but I'm going to let Dr. Mulhaney talk through that in greater detail. So if we look at the postgraduate training route in Ireland, so there are four different steps um, to become a consultant here in Ireland. As you can see, you start with your internship, your basic specialist training, your higher specialist training, and then on to becoming a consultant. So looking at the internship, that consists of a 12 month program and in Ireland here, you complete a minimum of three months in each of the medicine in general and surgery, and you may complete you may complete up to four months in other specialities. You can also complete your internship in academic medicine, and that's being recognised by the Medical Council for Intern Training now. Also, once you have completed your internship you are allocated a certificate of experience and you can then use this in other countries. So from there, you move on to your BST, your basic specialist training. There are four BST specialities um, and they are, depending on the speciality, will dictate the duration of that program. From there, it's a higher specialist training um, program and that's a, more of a structured supervised clinical training um, at specialist registrar level. And that can be four to six years in duration, depending on the speciality that you pursue. And then once you've completed this, you can apply for a consultant job and you can then apply for your specialist registration with the Medical Council here in Ireland. So I suppose for you guys, the first step to consider is the internship that is a 12 month program. 
Um, and I just thought it was important to highlight to you that Ireland and, and lots of the other pathways, the, the training network is divided into different um, locations within each country. In Ireland, it's in different six different networks throughout the country. And those networks, as you can see, each medical university is allocated a network. So RCSI have Dublin Northeast, and we also um, host um, interns down in Wexford. So I suppose it's to highlight that you may not be granted your preferred network. So you may think, you know, you want to complete an internship in Dublin, but depending on your ranking, depending on your application, that will dictate which network you are going to be allocated. So the timeline for postgraduate training in Ireland, it's quite a straightforward timeline in comparison to some of the other pathways. So really it's all done in your final year. So in the October, sort of November, it's around the 23rd of October to I think about the 5th of November. It's a small um, window, application window, but that opens up at the end of October and closes um, around the first, second week in November. For, uh, so you, you must submit your, submit your application in this time frame. And then semester two um, of your final year, the matching process begins. So you sort of um, I'll dictate where you would like to match to. And then you're depending on, on your ranking, you're matched to that. And that then if should you be successful, that internship program commences in the summer of your final year. Neve, sorry, can I yeah. just interrupt you a second? The yep. slideshow on the left <clears throat> is still in the deck mode. Just we'd be, be able to see the slides bigger if you put it into slideshow. Actually, Anna, Kara, do you know how to do that? I'm not sure how to do it on Zoom. Oh, um, if you go up to the top there, does it say sl slideshow for yourself? Yeah. Um, no, just on, you know where you're looking at your, your PowerPoint slides? Yeah. If you, the top of that screen there, it says slideshow to the left. Thank you. I, I noticed yeah, that I when I logged on and looked, I couldn't uh, see it. Next to the 73%, it's like a square. Maybe that will be a full screen. Yeah. Okay. Say that again, Yusuf. It's, um, you see on the bottom right corner where it says 73%. Just the guess it may not happen till right to the bottom right of the screen where it says 73%. Yeah. Yes, that one, maybe if you click in my. Yeah, actually, that's not working for me. There, Sorry but... to interrupt, it was just. Yay, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's better. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Kira. Well, Thanks, Yusuf. Mm -hmm. I'm in the United States, so if you need help uh, explaining with anything, I can I can step in. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, so the postgraduate training route in the USA. So in order to practice medicine in the USA, you must pass your U, U, USMLE, the United States Medical Licensing Examination. So just very briefly, these exams, um, there's a three-step exam process. So your step one, that's your basic sciences examination. That's a um, multiple choice questionnaire exam. Uh, Yusuf, if you've already sat it, you have experience of this perhaps. That is a, a long exam. It's an eight hour multiple choice questionnaire or question. Yes. For exam. the step one, we take usually our second year of medical school and we have six weeks of no school so we can train this book <laughs> if you're familiar with that what stage are you at yusuf i'm just a uh, ms2 right now okay okay yeah. very good yeah okay and um so once you've completed successfully completed step one you move on to step two step two consists of two exams one is your clinical knowledge again that's multiple choice questions and the clinical skills is a practical exam once you've completed step two successfully, you can then apply to the match process. Um, and then you proceed to your residency interviews. So our final year students this year who are looking to secure a residency program in the States are sitting the residency pro interviews at the moment. Um, match results typically come out in March and then you start your residency program in that summer. And step three, um, US MLE exam can be taken. Um, it, it can be taken after you've completed your residency program. So to complete the entire process and be registered with the United States, you must complete the three steps. So just to um, 
I have a question. Since step one right now, it is not a score. It's pass fail. That's right. How, how does that work? Yeah. So that's a very recent change, Yusuf. And um, so up till now, that's been a pass fail or, or sorry, a scoring um, route. And now it's going to be either you pass it or you fail it. Um, so, so your question, how is that going to work? Uh, more in detail, detail, like let's say I want to get into a competitive residency and back then the, the score determined if I can get that aside from research and everything. So what would be the best way to replace a good score if it's pass or fail? Yeah, and, and it's a really valid yeah. question and something yeah, actually we've been... Judy, sorry, I'll just jump in as well. Thanks, Niamh. No. Judy Harmy, um, who is the director who supports the USMLE process, Yusuf, I think that was Yusuf, um, she will be, they're, they're kind of reviewing that now as to where the, the um, where people will look instead of that score. And they're probably focusing on letters of reference and things like that. But it's a bit of a moving feast at the minute. Um, so I expect that to come out um, over the next period a little bit more between between Judy and and Anne Hopkins and a few others as to as to where where people will look instead of that score. Yeah, thanks, Noel. Yeah, and Yusuf, I think you know electors may come into play there as well, and possibly um, step two scores might become more valid than step previous step one also. But Noel's right; it's it's something we're kind of looking into and discussing with program directors on that. So we we'll keep you posted. So just to give you a brief overview of the um, USMLE timeline and where it fits into the RCSI timeline. So you're right, Yusuf, third year is really when it all kicks off. So semester two of, um, of your third year, so springtime, RCSI um, asks students who are considering the USMLE to sit a diagnostic exam. Um, you must pass this diagnostic exam before our RCSI will approve you to go ahead and take your USMLE step exams. The reason for this is really to um, ensure that you are on the right path, that you are preparing yourself well um, to make you more competitive to challenge those step exams. So typically then, and again, this is an ideal scenario. It doesn't have to be taken this way, but we've seen from previous results that this is probably the most competitive way to challenge these exams. So the summer of um, your third year, we would encourage you to sit your USMLE step one exam. Then in your fourth year, really it's the semester two, so the summertime. So you would then go ahead and sit your um, step two, your clinical skills and your clinical knowledge. Now these typically, um, it's mandatory that they're taken in the US. This year with COVID, they have actually um, eliminated the clinical skills and replaced it with an English exam. Um, and they have done the multiple choice um, CK exam and they're doing that virtually. Um, in an ideal scenario, you would then complete some clinical electives in the US, ideally to in that summer also. So then in your final year in semester one, you would have an opportunity to um, complete a third elective and you then start with your residence, residency applications. And then early in semester two, as I had said, sort of our final year students now are sitting the residency interviews, match results come out in March and then you commence your training in the, in the summer of that final year after you've graduated. So it's a very, very quick overview of that timeline, um, but I think it's a good, a good to give you an idea of, of where you need to prepare, be preparing and the time frame in that. So Niamh, move on. Niamh, before you yeah. leave the US, can I just add a point for anyone who, who's thinking of doing the USMLE? We have had students, despite all of the, the information, you know, like this, but I think, you know, Judy brings through the students, the whole process at the start of every year. We have had situations where people then miss the deadline. Um, and because this is a sort of a, an international thing, there is only one deadline. So I'd really encourage everyone to, at the start of each sort of student or um, college year, 
to to focus on the deadlines that people are drawing their attention to because it does take periods of you know seven weeks for example to get results back from various exams and if you don't get in at the right times you there is a risk that you miss deadlines so really pay attention to the the sessions held through the year that kind of um that uh, outline when you ought to tackle these things and and uh, and then you can you will you'll ensure then you won't miss any deadlines Thanks, No. Okay, so I'm going to move through Canada. So again, re, you know, the overview are, are the, the steps involved in that are the NAC and the MCCQ exam. So the first step is you apply for those. I'll cover the timeline in my next slide, but the steps are you apply for the exams, you sit your MCCQ exam part one first, you then sit your NAC exam, you apply to the um, CARMS, you then sit your residency interviews, match results come out, you start your residency program, and then um, further on in your residency program, you sit the um, MCCQ exam part two. So the time frame um, for the CARMS deadline is similar to the US, you know, it starts in, but starts in the fourth year. So in semester two, um, of your fourth year, you apply for the NAC and the MCCQ exam. Then in semester one of your final year, you can sit the MCCQ exam. So you have two options of when you went to sit that, whether that's in between June and September and October to November of, of your uh, first semester. I suppose to, to add a point here with, with particularly the US and the Canadian exams, just remember that these are exams are running alongside your RCSI exams. So, you know, there's a lot to consider here. So your semester one of your final year, you have your MCCQ exam, and you also have your NAC exam, um, which can be taken between September and October, and you would then apply to CARMS. Semester two, you have your Canadian res residency interviews. That's similar to the US resi residency interviews just a, a little bit later. So our final year students who are applying to the Canadian match will be sitting their residency interviews in March um, of this year. And then the results, the match results come out around April. And again, all those who are successful commence their internship in Canada um, in that summer. Neve, sorry, can I just jump in there on that one? Um, Please. I, I know students in the past um, somewhat have applied for both Canada and um, the US. Um, and historically, Canada would have um, released first and they would have been interviewed first. But just with COVID, everything has been switched around. So, so if you're looking back on some of this detail, yes, they have swapped. So students now, um, some of whom who would have applied to both in the same sitting in, in the same final year um, now find themselves um, covering the US first and then Canada and um, maybe perhaps the following year in terms of matching. So it has a lot of this has changed as you can see um, with COVID. Um, so so as Nola and Neve have both said it's really important to keep an eye on all of these websites because they're updated so often um, uh, and just keep them on your main tab and, and check them regularly. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry, Clear, I see thanks. Arian has, yeah. has their hand up there. Do you have a question? Do you have a question, Arian? Arian? No, sorry, I thought they were asking a question. Yeah, there's a hand up there, but he, he might come back. Kira, thanks. And Kira is really the Canadian expert. Um, so, so you know, knows everything that's going on there. Um, and, and one of my slides at the end, you know, I, Kira's right and Nola's right. It's really important that you keep an eye on all of the different websites. I have links to those um, on one of the final slides. And we will also, as best we can, keep you updated. But, you know, it's, it's best that you also keep yourself updated at all times. So we'll move on to the UK. And the postgraduate training in the UK consists of um, a foundation year. So that's the foundation program, which is um, a two-year program. Um, you can apply for, you can also apply for the academic foundation program and the psychiatry foundation program through this also. So once you've completed your foundation, uh, your two-year foundation program in the UK, you then move on to your specialist training. 
This can take anywhere between three to 10 years, depending on the speciality that you're deciding on. Um, and once you have th those two um, levels of training completed, you can then apply to the UK Medical Council, and then you continue with your continuous professional development throughout your career. So the timeline for the UK Foundation Programme um, really all takes place um, the summer prior to your final year and then throughout the final year. So July to September of SC1, sort of beginning of SC2, your final year, eligibility applications open. So that's where you apply to the UK Foundation Programme um, to assess your eligibility. Um, should you be successful with that, you then move through to the application window that opens um, in October through to November of your final year. And then December and January of your final year, so beginning of uh, semester two, you have your situational judgment test. And then the offers for the UK Foundation Programme typically come out in March and that foundation program commences in the summer. Again, you know, to reiterate what we're telling you is to keep an eye on the websites for change of dates. You know, this is an overview of dates, but they do change from time to time. We have experienced, particularly with COVID, that things have changed, um, but it's important that you keep an eye on those websites. So there, there are sort of the top five pathways and you know, some what we, when we were considering pulling together this, we're sort of thinking, okay, so what is it that you can be doing now? So what you can be doing now is attending events like you're attending here this morning, which involves researching the career pathways and considering your career matching strategy. So what we mean by a career matching strategy is really, okay, are you going, you know, are you are you going to apply to multiple pathways? If so, what's your preference. So what's the number one ambition? Is it to return to Kuwait? Um, is it to practice here in Ireland? Do you see yourself in the US? Where is it that you see yourself? And then once you have identified what those ambitions are, then it's to be very clear about what's involved in that pathway between pathway or between um, application dates. Um, you know, work visas also come into this so you need to um, inform yourself about that um, and, and just be very clear about those pathways and keep an eye on those. You can start developing your professional skills. Um, that is again attending workshops. We are, I wanted to highlight here a, a, a series that we're running with the School of Medicine which is a professional identity series. Now it's primarily aimed at senior medical students, so I would say sort of fourth and fifth year SC1, SC2 medical students. Um, and it is on the what, the why, and the how of personal statements, professional networking, LinkedIn, CV workshop, resilience workshops, and reflective practice in medicine. So it's really about helping you to um, develop your own professional skills and your professional identity, which is something we're seeing is becoming more and more important in the medical career space. You can start or continue to engage with career development advisors. So myself, uh, my colleague Kira, my colleague Yvonne Joseph, we are the career development advisors. My colleague Paul is here also. I know you have your hand up, Paul, and I'm gonna to come to you in a sec. Um, so Paul, Paul is um, very involved in the UK um, Foundation Programme and the USMLE Programme, so can support you with queries in relation to that. Um, and then I would really encourage you to interact with RCS student societies. This is where you can start to build your professional network. Um, Dr. Al Mulhaney might speak about that when, when he's speaking with you, but it's, you know, you, the, your fellow students are going is going to be are going to be part of your professional network for the future so it's important that you start to build those relationships now so that you have a foundation for the future paul did you want to jump in here on something yeah um hi everyone um neve yeah i was just going to add a slight um uh, make a slight addition to the ukfb um yeah, you can apply for the uh, foundation program, the two-year program. But also, if you've done an internship, um, if you've done a one-year postgrad training, you can also apply to the foundation program standalone, which is the F2, and that will be one year. And 
So you just apply for that and then you can sort of go into uh, specialism after that as well. So there are kind of two options, you know. So if you haven't gotten through to the foundation year to year program, you can apply for the standalone program as well. Um, and just to add, um, Neve, I don't know if you, um, I'm not sure, I don't know if you covered that now, but, you know, with the whole Brexit situation at the moment, the PLAB requirement it doesn't seem to be a thing now if you've graduated from um, a European medical school. So I, I think, you know, it's a bit more open now for those. I think in the past, non-EU um, graduates, you know, there was a requirement to sit PLAB. But, but I think, you know, from the latest information coming from the GMC, I think that requirement is not necessary now. I think what's required now is that you've graduated from um, a European medical school. Um, but uh, yeah, so I just thought to add that, all right? Yeah, thanks a million, Paul. Thanks for that, I appreciate that. Okay. Um, so these are just some really useful Which things. country has better Ruka lounges? Sorry, sorry, can you repeat that question? Which country has the best Ruka lounges? I'm sorry, I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Um, how long is the process for? I, I didn't get that any. Did Kira or Paul, did you hear that at all? I'm not no. sure. Are you asking about the colleges? Did you say something about colleges? Oh, they've gone anyway. Yeah. Okay. If anybody, if you do have additional questions that you haven't been able to ask here or for some reason you haven't been able to hear you, please don't hesitate to, to contact us at Career Hub or my email address is nevemullen at rcsi.ie. Um, these are useful links to pages here. So um, any information that we're giving you here today, we upload to the Career Readiness Centre. Excuse Readiness. me. Readiness. Yes. Excuse me. Yes. Okay, that's breaking down there, I think. Okay, I'll, I'll continue on. So we have um, LinkedIn and we are rolling out a LinkedIn learning platform that is open to all RCSI students. This is a wonderful way to start developing your professional skills and your professional identity. And um, the link to the LinkedIn learning is here. You can log in with your RCSI email and your password. And then these are the links to the USMLE, CARMS, the UK, and the HSE. So for any further information <laughs> on the actual programs, um, on timelines, they're all there. If I can ask you to mute your, your mic, sir, that would be great. Um, but everything that you're seeing here is also on our Career Readiness Centre Moodle page. So I, um, I have completed my presentation. So thank you very much for, for being here, everybody, and for your questions. Um, I'm going to um, introduce Dr. Al Mulhaney. And again, just to um, thank Dr. Al Mulhaney for taking the time out of his busy schedule, I'm sure at the moment, to be here. Um, Dr. Al Mulhaney, are you here? Yes, yes. Uh, it's my pleasure, actually. It's my pleasure, actually. Uh, helping you regarding this uh, lovely topic. And thank you, Niamh, for your uh, precise uh, presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, welcome everybody. And uh, I'd, like to give, I'd like to give you uh, a brief presentation about what is next to Kuwait, when you arrive to Kuwait. So as Niamh said, you know, there are uh, four or five pathways after graduation. So I will talk mainly about the Kuwait. So uh, Kuwait Medical Association, it's like, you know, the, uh, if you remember uh, the uh, National Protection Society in Ireland, you know, and the National Defense. It's the society uh, dedicated for all doctors and uh, it will help them in multiple ways, including like, you know, against medical errors and all these things. It will also give them, you know, uh, the updates regarding the conferences, which happenings in Kuwait. So this is the first step. So whoever graduated from any college and applying to Kuwait, he first need to register in the Kuwait Medical Association. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, the Ministry of Health. Uh, there are actually three pathways for doctors in Kuwait. There is the Ministry of Health, there is the Ministry of Defense, and there is Kuwait Oil Company. I would like to talk mainly about the Ministry of Health because 
The others are semi-private. So uh, uh, the Minister of Health, it's the second step after after registering the through the Kuwait Medical Association, you need to uh, apply through the Minister of Health, and then it will give you uh, the possibilities where which hospitals you are going to. So next slide, please. Kuwait Institute for Medical Specialization, which is, stands for KIMS. This is the institute for all trainees to register in first of all. So even if you are applying later on for the Ministry of Health or Ministry of Defense or, or the Kuwait Oil Company, um, Kuwait Institute for Medical Specialization is specialized for the trainees, the internships, and the postgraduate studies. So after you are done with Kuwait Medical Institution, then you can switch to the three pathways to where that medical, the Ministry of Health or Ministry of Defense or the Kuwait Medical uh, through the uh, Kuwait Oil Company. Next slide, please. So the first hospital, which is the oldest, and uh, I'm honored to work in this hospital, is the Al Amiri Hospital. Al Amiri Hospital established in 1949. It's one of the oldest hospitals in Kuwait and it's covered the, uh, the capital area. It's one of the seven uh, government hospitals in Kuwait. Uh, and this is um, mainly having uh, uh, the main departments, which are the Department of Medicine, Department of Surgery, the Department of Pediatrics, and Department of uh, Emergency. Uh, there is no uh, orthopedic or uh, obstetrics and gynecology, but there is Al Sabah Hospital, which can cover these uh, areas. Next slide, please. This is Mubarak Al Kabir Hospital, established in 1982, is the second oldest in Kuwait, and uh, it's actually the one created for the university. So it's a teaching hospital as well, and it it's, it's similar to Al Amiri. It has all subspecialties except for the obstetrics and gynecology. Next slide, please. Al Sabah Hospital, established in 1984. Uh, this is actually, it's a tertiary hospital where uh, it has all the subspecialties, including ENT, ophthalmology, and the obstetrics and gynecology in al Sabah Hospital. It can cover both Al-Amiri and Mubarak Al-Kabir Hospital. Next slide, please. Al-Farwani Hospital, it's a general hospital which has all the subspecialties, including obstetrics and gynecology. It covers Al-Farwani Hospital. It's a big uh, area actually, it covers around 1 million of the population uh, south, of, south of Kuwait. Uh, in the top picture, you, you can see the current uh, Farwani Hospital, and the bottom picture is the new Farwani Hospital, which is going to open soon, hopefully in the next couple of months. Next slide, please. Al Adan Hospital, it's covered the other side of the uh, south in Kuwait, the southeast. Uh, it's a big hospital as well covers around uh, 800,000 of population, and it's a, a multidisciplinary uh, hospital which has all the subspecialties, including obstetric and gynecology. Next slide, please. Al Jahra Hospital, uh, it covers the north of Kuwait, around uh, 1 million population as well, and uh, it's a newly uh, uh, established hospital, actually one of the recent, and uh, there is some uh, new developments. Uh, you can see the picture on the lower side. It's comprised of four main buildings, which will cover also future plans for the new population arriving from the north. Next slide, please. Jabra Al Sabah Hospital. It's actually the newest in Kuwait, and it covers. Uh, it is actually the sixth biggest in the Middle East. Um, it covers around uh, 1,300 beds uh, of an, a population of around 1 million and a half. And unfortunately, you know, after the COVID, this hospital, it's purely covering COVID patients. Uh, so uh, any other COVID patients who arrive in other hospitals, they usually they stay for around 48 hours and then they transfer to Jabr uh, Sabah Hospital. Next slide, please. Now, this is regarding electives. Uh, actually, some students, they prefer to uh, do an electives before deciding whether they want to do uh, the internship in Kuwait or not. 
So uh, this is a brief talk about the electives. You can do electives in any of the previous general seven hospitals. Um, simply what you need is a letter from the college. And then you go to the Ministry of Higher Education if you are sponsored, where you get approved. And then you go to the Ministry of Health to choose which uh, rotation you would like to do. Um, and then after, the, after you're finishing your elective, we can give you evaluation form. Uh, actually, I've been uh, in, in the ministry for around 15 years, and I've seen a lot of uh, final medical year students from RCSI joining us for the electives. They do like a four weeks elective, and uh, it's very, very beneficial and very helpful for them to decide whether they want to do, you know, the electives in Kuwait, the, sorry, the traineeship in Kuwait, or they'll go back to Ireland. Next slide, please. So this is the internship year in Kuwait. Uh, it's a one year, comprises of four months of general internal medicine and four months of general surgery, one month of general pediatrics, one month of obstetrics and gynecology, and two separate months of elective rotations where the uh, doctor can choose if he wants to do like ENT, ophthalmology, orthopedic, emergency medicine, radiology, all other specialties he didn't do in the past, uh, uh, you know, for the uh, other four rotations. Next slide, please. So this is a quick look about the medical ranks in Kuwait. Uh, so you start with internship, which is a trainee, and then the assistant registrar. Uh, this is the equivalent to the HSO, uh, senior, uh, senior house officer, SHO in, in Ireland. And then the registrar, where you finish your first part of medical exams, like the MRCP or the MRCPI. And then the senior registrar who completed the MRCP or MRCPI, or who completed the Kuwait Medical Board or any other um, postgraduate studies, whether in UK, Ireland, States, or Canada. The specialist is the first rank of consultancy. Uh, so it's usually after three years of finishing the medical board, and then the senior specialist is another three year from the specialist. And the consultant, which is the last rank, is another three years after this senior specialist. Next slide, please. So uh, the good news is actually two years ago, the Kuwait Institute for Medical Specialization got accredited by the Royal College uh, of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. So now there are a co collaboration between them. So most of our uh, uh, exams and uh, boards are supervised by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. Uh, this step also gave uh, some benefit for the doctors as well. So if they started the Kuwaiti Board of Internal Medicine or any other uh, medical boards or surgical boards in the Kuwait Institute of Medical Specialization, while they are in the final year, they can actually uh, have uh, interviews through Zoom or Skype uh, by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada for their subspecialty uh, studies or postgraduates. And uh, they can get even approval whether they, are, uh, they want to continue uh, their fellowship trainings in Canada. So this is a major step actually happened to Kuwait uh, two years ago. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the postgraduates that uh, we are having in Kuwait now. The Kuwaiti board through KIMS, the Saudi board through the uh, Saudi National uh, Health Society, um, the Canadian board through the FRCBC, and the American board, the ABIM. Next slide, please. These are the fellowship programs. We have the Kuwaiti, Saudi, the Canadian, and the American. These are the ones also, most of the people who do the program, they continue until the fellowship. Special things here to mention is that we have the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland. Uh, both of them through the, uh, if it's from the medical side, from the uh, Royal College of Physicians of Ireland. And uh, through, the, through the United Kingdom, we have them through the, um, if it's surgical side, you have also the Royal College of Surgeons. Um, it is it is very, it's recent actually, it happens to us in the past three or four uh, years that we send uh, 
Kuwaiti doctors to the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom. And actually to mention, we have two pure Irish programs through KIMS, which are the Radiology Board and the Anesthesia Board. These are pure, uh, you know, Irish programs. Both of them are uh, in collaboration with the Royal College of Surgeons. Uh, also, now recently, um, we are trying to get the approval for the GPs, the MRC GPI from Ireland, to get a third program uh, into Kuwait Institute for Medical Specialization. Next slide, please. So, this is my end actually. Uh, so, if you have any questions, I'm happy to help anytime. And uh, I can give you my email, which is A-W-S-A-N Almohani, A L M O H A I N I, at rcsi.com. And I'll be happy to help in any time, anywhere, by email or by Zoom. And thank you, Nick, for your uh, invitation. Dr. Almohany, thank you so much. Um, that was really interesting for me, I'm sure for students as well. That was really interesting to hear. And there, there's been a lot of progression, it, it seems, um, with the, with Kim's and the different routes yes. that you're taking. Well done. It sounds great. I think I, I need to write my email. Yeah. If Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Almohany? Okay, or if anybody has any questions for myself or any of my colleagues from the Compass team, please feel free to ask. Um, as I said, our, you can contact us on the, our Career Hub email um, or any of us on our RCSI email addresses. Please do engage with us in the workshops, um, you know, the workshops that we put on. Um, you know, this one, I was um, speaking with Demma from Kim Sai and we, she sort of researched what would be an appropriate one? And we felt that this was one that- um, I think there is a question if uh, one said yeah. uh, you have to do that. No, you are not. You can't do it. If you are an RCSI graduate, uh, even the Ministry of Higher Education, they give you uh, the benefit. If you want to do the uh, training ship in Ireland, you can. So there is, you can, they can give you a choice whether you want to do it in Kuwait or in Ireland. Okay, good. So, 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 so there is no uh, obligation even from the Ministry of Higher Education. Actually, even they, they will sponsor you to do it there if you want. Wow, that's a great opportunity, isn't it? I, um, sorry, I, I think Noel's got his okay. hand up. Noel, do you yeah, want to go? Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, there's, two, there's two things. I think, I think a lot of the people were muted there, so they're pu putting some questions on the chat. But doctor, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, I have a question just with regard to COVID and, and I suppose the marketplace or the, or the, the, the medical system in, in Kuwait, is it is there more opportunities more requirement for medical professionals like for the students on the call is are you seeing a, an increased demand and um, yes, do you see this just growing and growing yes actually um, from the first wave uh, around february when it happened in kuwait initially we had some issues regarding the number of doctors in kuwait uh, so actually maybe you heard the news we got help from Cuba and from Pakistan. We brought doctors just to, to help us to pass through it. And even the medical students from Kuwait University. So, uh, mm. so most of them, they you know volunteered to join us, which, which was very, uh, you know, good and help, helps the ministry a lot. But thank God, you know, midway around the, the crisis, which was now June or July, so we settled. Uh, we opened a lot of uh, field hospitals. Mm. So, you know, even the doctors, they were scattered in an equal uh, number. So we overcome the, this problem around two or three months ago. Uh, for now, we are, um, we are okay. We are holding so far. Um, even the Kuwait, Kuwait University, you know, we, we did what, similar to what the RCSI did regarding the students. You know, we, we finished the exams quickly by the virtual exams and then, you know, so that they can help us. So, so I think we are fine now, but we will, we will not say no to any help, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's just interesting. Does it, does it, does it force people to reshape the, the, yes. the plans for yes, the future? Yes, yes. Thank you. 
Um, there's some questions coming through, um, Neve. if you want to go through. There's one about what are the Canadian board specialties in Kuwait? Um, doctor, I'm not sure if you can address a yeah, couple of those yeah. questions. Uh, you mean, if he means fellowship, um, we have uh, actually, Kim, uh, the Kuwait Institute for Medical Specialization, uh, when they signed the collaboration uh, with the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ireland, the collaboration means they have uh, allocated seats that we have around 50 seats for the fellowship programs in Canada. And this 50 seats, you know, uh, seats are, uh, you know, scattered between most of subspecialties. So, so once you are done with the Kuwaiti Board of Internal Medicine, for example, and then you go to Kim's, they will uh, allocate you for uh, an interview in Canada. Uh, the seats are mainly, you know, rheumatology, endocrine, gastroenterology, respiratory medicine, intensive care, uh, diabetology, rheumatology. So, so most of the subspecialties. But the meaning of allocated seats, it means they are competitive, you know? So if I have like 50 seats and I have like around 100 graduates, so it means 50 will get accepted and other 50 will not. So, but it's, it's a good start, you know? Before that, you know, we don't have a fellowship uh, programs, but now we are allocating to uh, Canada. Also the fellowships that we have also in the, in the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland now, we have respiratory places, we have rheumatology, we have around, around 15 or, or 16 Kuwaiti doctors now doing their fellowship programs in Ireland. So, so Kuwait, we don't have like, you know, a North American system or European system. We are kind of mixed, you know? We have like 50 seats in Canada, around 15 in Ireland, 10 in UK, in Saudi Arabia, we have around 20. So that's what we are doing now to cover all the doctors who want to go for fellowship programs. Fantastic. And, and there's a question from, from Ahmad. Ahmad is asking about, you know, taking the USMLE and do you think I should take it even though I'm not considering the US now? Ahmad, I think the, the key thing in this situation is to actually engage, as Neve has said, engage with the careers team. You can set up a, a session. They'll be able to set up further sessions with, you know, the maybe the director of the USMLE, for example, if that was needed. But um, there's a lot of people, uh, I think, like you who ask that question. I think they get a they get a lot of value out of one to one sessions, as alluded to by Neve in the, in in the presentation. They can keep their option open, by the way. Yeah. I mean, you don't know what will happen next. You know, nobody expected COVID to happen in 2020. You know, so. So if you got the USMLEs, you don't know, you might use them. Um, I, myself, I, when I came to Kuwait, I, I went for the Canadian exam and I got it. And then I decided to stay in Kuwait. But the good thing, I have choices, you know? So, so you, you can always keep your options open. Yep, you're right, Dr. al Mohani. And I think when I spoke about your career strategy, that's the intention there is to keep your options open, to have you know, a plan B, a plan C, and a plan D. Exactly. Um, yeah. No, look here, I might, I, I'm not seeing those questions. So if there's further questions, if either of you wouldn't mind reading them out. Uh, no, no, just a further comment from Ahmad and saying thank you for that. So that's no problem. Um, I've, there's one back from, from, um, from Kim said, do we, have, do we have to do the internship year in Kuwait? So, so, so no is the answer to that, but um, I think the doctor has no, touched no. on the various options there. If you are if you are an Irish graduate, you can do it in Ireland. That's if you right. are a UK graduate, you can do it in the UK. And you have the option also of doing it in Kuwait, no problem. If you are sponsored, they will continue the, uh, their sponsorship for another year, an extra year. And, 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 and Mossab is looking for the email addresses. So doctor, you've provide, you'll provide that to Neve um, and also to... Um, uh, oh, you've, done, you, you've done that already. I can see that now in the second chat. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Um, is the radiology board in Kuwait led by RCSI? Yes, so Pro my, my good friend, Professor Lee. He's an examiner as well. Professor RCSI. Yes, they are the radiology and the anesthesia program. Both are Irish. And recently, um, hopefully, uh, we will get the approval for the uh, general practitioners. GP, yeah. Yes, GP. So that's Clive Lee. Clive, oh, yes. The one, the one and only. Clive. Thank you for that, Sarah. Um, asked that question, Sarah. Is that enough for that? Is that you know? Is that a simple yes for that one? 
And that looks like all the questions. And forgive me if I, yeah, thank you, so Sarah. If, forgive me if I've missed any questions. I think that's that's them all, Neve. Oh no, hang on, there's, I, there's one more coming through. What are the pros and cons of doing the internship in Kuwait versus Ireland? Um, other, um, other than the weather, do you want to talk, oh, about, uh, um, talk about that one, Doctor? Um, actually, it's, it's nothing. If, if you plan uh, of getting, you know, the, the Kuwaiti program, Kuwaiti Board of Medical Association program, uh, if you do the internship in Kuwait, it will be better for you for a reason. So that they, you, you will know the times and the, you know, the, uh, you get recommendations from Kuwait. This is maybe the only advantage. But, but the, even I have a lot of students who graduated from Ireland and they did the internship in Ireland. When they came back to Kuwait, they joined the program with no problems. Sometimes only the difference because, you know, in Ireland, the uh, internship runs from January to January or sometimes from July to July. But in Kuwait, we have a different system. You know, whenever you graduate, you can join. So maybe this is the only difference, you know, timing. And, and it will not delay you a lot. It might delay you mm -hmm. for a couple of months, you know, not, not, not a big thing, you know. That's good to know. Oh, that, there, there, there is one individual on the, uh, under the name M.A. that would like to turn. Can he be unmuted um, so he can ask yes. he or she? I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Go for it. Yes. yes. Thanks a lot for your uh, valuable time and your, uh, guidance. Um, I have a question that could be a bit unusual. Uh, there is usually a, tend a tendency that uh, medical students uh, look for the next qualification and to, to specialize more. But what if uh, someone graduated from RCSI with a bachelor degree and he decided not to to, to go for the next qualification and not to specialize, and he just wants to go and practice medicine, what disadvantage he will be at? Uh, you, you will not progress in your career, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, the postgraduate, you know, there are, you know, you know, part one and part two exams or a structured program. These are the ones who will make you, you know, a specialist and a consultant, you know? If you, if you decided to stay on the first qualification, I'll tell you what, there are new branches of medicine now, nowadays, you know, the, the, you know, the administrative medicine. Now the public health, the awareness, the ministry itself, it needs doctors, you know? So, and we need doctors to run them. So even recently, you know, so many, so many doctors, once they finish, you know, from the medical school, they join uh, their countries, and they decide that they are, you know, they are. They don't want to go to through the hospitals or through uh, patient contacts. They switch into administrative medicine, which is an important part of medicine as well. Uh, even even the academics we have, you know, you know the chems, for example, is run by doctors, and most of them are organizers. You know, they they don't deal with patients, but they deal with doctors. Uh, uh, even you know now we have some places that need doctors, you know, that like Kuwait Oil Company, they need occupational health doctors, um, uh, Kuwait Airways, they need doctors for them. So, 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 so does it mean if you don't complete your postgraduate studies, that, that's it, you know? There are so many other opportunities. So you would recommend that um, a bachelor graduate take the next qualification directly? Uh, you can, you can settle for a couple of years. Uh, seek your options because a lot of students or doctors when they graduate they don't know what they are going to do next so this is the, the beauty of the internship year so you go to all the subspecialities and then you can see yourself where, where, where you fit in and that's why also in Kuwait if you come to Kuwait you know there are seven hospitals some of them they, they keep rotating in these seven hospitals until they settle you know they will, they will feel okay this is my environment I settle here. I think I belong here. And then they can decide which speciality they will go to. Much clearer. Thanks, Emily. Appreciate it. Anytime. Thanks. Doctor, um, Ahmad has kind of has come back on the question. I think he's... Um, uh, I think um, there is a question from Sarah. Kim's, is Kim's certified? Yes. Uh, the Kuwait Institute for Medical Specialization is uh, an internationally recognized. You can do the fellowships, as I said. After that, into Canada, the States, UK, Ireland, 
with no complication, with no hesitancy, and it's um, uh, Canadian uh, accredited. Welcome, Sarah. Uh, another question? Uh, sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no problem. It was actually just a follow up from Ahmad, really, Ahmad, in relation yeah. to um, <laughs> does the internship from Ireland or Kuwait look better in the C in, um, in, on the CV? So I know you said there was pros and cons were quite it was quite similar. But from a CV perspective, maybe in Kuwait, if you're looking for a job in Kuwait, does it matter? Um, a little bit. Not 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 that not, not that uh, you know big deal you know because because if you are in Kuwait and you work in, with someone uh, my, I am myself is the assistant program director for the Kuwaiti Board of Internal Medicine mm -hmm. so if someone works with me as an intern I would know you know so it's like you know yes I know this guy I can recommend him it's 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 a faster route but you know there is no issues regarding uh, whoever do the internship in Ireland or in the UK. You know, they are bigger names than Kuwait by the end of the day, you know. Thank you for that. Uh, does the CV play a major role? Uh, yes, because, for example, if you are applying for the Kuwaiti Board of Internal Medicine, we have around 20 seats each year, and we have more than 50 candidates. So the better the CV, the more chances that you will get into the 20 out of the 50, you know? So what can you do with the CV? If you are in Ireland, you know, try to get as much as you can, you know, join the colleges for researches, uh, try to get a, uh, a publication, you know, it all will help you because when, when you apply and the, the better CV, the better, you know, chances that you will get into the a place for the postgraduate studies, not, not even in Kuwait, it's, it's everywhere. Okay, it seems like um, everyone asked their questions. So I'd like to thank you, Dr. Amhaney, um, on behalf of Kemsei, um, for your time. And also thank you, um, Aniv and Kira, for helping me organize this event. And also all of um, Compass team for attending and helping us run the event too. Um, it was very helpful, so thank you so much. Thank you. You're very welcome, Gemma, and, and I wanted to say thank you, thanks to you, and I'll email you through these slides, and if you wish, you can put them up on the Kimsai website, um, so all of the contact details and the information are on the slides as well. Yes, thank you. No thank problem. You. Take care. Thanks again, Dr. Take Omer. care, everyone. Great thanks to see you. Thanks, Nave. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye, Dr. Thanks.